Let's take a special look at investing in emerging markets. And my next guest, he does business all over the world. I want to welcome former presidential candidate, as well as the current chief executive of Titan International, Maury Taylor. Maury, good to have you with us on Bloomberg. Pleasure. Now, Thank you. tires. Yeah. This is what Titan does, and these are not the ordinary kind of tires that you get to put on your car, but I got a feeling this is about big trucks, big farm equipment, tires. Well, it's tires, but you have to stop. There's A tire is no good unless it has a wheel, the steel part in it. We're the only ones who make the wheel, and we make the tire. And to give you an idea from like 10 inch, all the way up to uh, 13 and a half feet. 13 and a half feet. Yeah, if you roll those down uh, Lexington here, you'd squash an awful lot of cars. So they weigh about about 12,000 pounds a piece. And I'm assuming these are not things that you can just call up someone and they get delivered the next morning. I mean, it's the kind of thing you got to plan a little bit ahead for. You, you better plan. And contrary to what so many people think, a tire, because it's so common, that somehow they mix something up and they pour it into a mold and it pops out. That's not how they are. They're stealing them. There's, uh, in our type, in our business, it's total labor. There's no real automatic, uh, you know, nothing's, the system's not automatic. So, um, you have to have people have to have that skill. actually use, that know how to make these things. We have 3,000 Americans that 95% um, of them, uh, as I always say, they do one super job. The other five, um, I'd like to have them go work for the government. They fit right in. Now, in those uh, in, in, that, in those contexts right now, you've been spending time focused on economies outside the United States as well as what's going on here, but specifically a lot of agriculture, right? Because you talked about how cotton, soybeans, wheat, corn, these crops need machinery in order to harvest them. There's no question, but... When you, most Americans don't realize that big equipment, the big food basket of the world, happens to be America and American farmers' main competitor in corn, soybean, or cotton happen to be in South America. And then if you take wheat, which is the fourth big crop, then you have to think of Canada, Australia, the Ukraine and Russia. But what most people don't realize why the American farmer and my friends at John Deere and uh, Deere is a, um, you know, they're the big gorilla of farm. And they're doing a great job. But what happens is that in the corn, soybean, and the cotton, used to be Brazil would kind of like. South America beat my poor American farmers up. But people forget currency. The real used to be four to one. Four reals to one dollar. Now today, it's one to one seven. So the American farmer is doing real well if he's in those crops. And when you move over to our friends, the wheat, which is all your bread, you see that the Canadian currency is not 65 cents to the dollar. It's like almost pop. It's parity, right? And then you got Australia's doing good because of all of the uh, mining and everything there. So now the American farmer is in a renaissance of growth and it's going to keep happening. And um, it's just, uh, you know, the manufacturing, if we could get the government off of the manufacturing side, uh, this country would be booming right now. It's a shame what we're going through. Talk a little bit about the emerging economies, because I know that Titan is focused there as well. And as you just described it, if the currency in places like Brazil appreciates, that means that they can afford to import tires that are made by Titan. Well, only tires, you see, when you look at the world and you look at the, um, uh, the trade policies, uh, we have the greatest working men and women of the world. We have factories in our wheel side around the world. So no one will really beat us if we work. Our problem is the government. You mentioned Brazil. If you make it in Brazil, then you can't ship it in. It's just like in China. 
people forget, you can't ship tires to China, even if you're cheaper, they won't let them in. So they protect their own. It's only the stuff that they can't get that they want that they let so them bring here. it in. That's right. And then what happens is they'll turn around and they'll tell you, well, when, when you do so good, well, you can't ship anymore unless you put a factory here. They create jobs. We do just the opposite here. And I mean, I'm being honest. That's the way I see it. So what needs to change in terms of policy from the administration or indeed from Congress to help these kinds of businesses prosper? It's a very simple situation. You know, trade is, is universal. So you basically say, hey, you want to ship into our country? No problem. But you got open and we ship into you. If you're going to restrict us, then, you know, we should restrict them. I mean, you think about this. Uh, if you go back, and you remember, there was only one other superpower before with us. The Russians. We don't have favored nation trade with the Russians. And they, that's, they were becoming democratic. We didn't help them. We went to their enemy, the Russians. I mean, the commies, I China. I want to thank you for helping us understand Titan. Appreciate it. Maury Taylor. Thank you. Taking a special look at emerging markets today. My next guests are experts in Russia, among other things. We have Lawrence Di Maria. He covers the agriculture industry for Stern, AG, and Leach. He is among the most accurate analysts on ADCO. They sell farm equipment as well as Aztec Industries. If you ever want to pave the road as well as WEG. Andrei Sizov is a managing director of Sovikon, a Russian agriculture research and consulting firm. Gentlemen, welcome to Bloomberg. Good to have you with us. Uh, Larry, you're hosting a conference on agriculture and emerging markets. Can you just give us a little highlight as to what the conference is about and who's attending? Sure. The conference is really a global look at the agriculture cycle that we think is going on now, which is a very strong cycle, a little bit different regionally, but to kind of talk about which different regions are important, we had a guest come from Brazil, we have our friend Andre come from Russia, we have the major companies from CNH and John Deere, uh, Titan you just had on the, on, uh, on the show, and they all come in and talk about what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what the real cycles are, what's driving demand, uh, and we've had economists come in, and it's really a mix of cycle stories and then how to invest in the in the ag cycle through the specific companies because we're all equ equity guys all right now let me bring you in andre because i know that you're a specialist in really figuring out the agricultural trends particularly yep. in russia what are the uh, what are the, the the sort of situation now in regards to wheat because that was in the headlines because of the severe drought the country was facing yeah we have a severe drought and due to abnormal weather conditions we have a very bad crop after two three years of very good crops and during those years russia became uh, one of the major exporters of wheat as the world market ranking among the first three but this year uh, due to the drought and bad uh, harvest we have banned our exports and uh, prices have gone up uh, pretty fast. Do you think that fast. that trend is going to continue, this increase in wheat prices? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, if we look fundamentally at the uh, world wheat stocks, they are relatively at high level. And all of those uh, droughts all over the world, flood stories all over the world, it's the situation not that bad. I think market overreacted if we look at that fundamentally. Larry, I noted today that cotton, for example, is over a dollar a pound. And when you take a look at what's happened in Pakistan, wiping out about 20 percent of their cotton crop, right. is this part of the thesis? is that it's a combination of natural and tragic disasters, but also just that sustained demand from emerging economies right. means the price of a lot of these agricultural products is going to rise. It's true. A lot of the commodities are very, very interrelated. Cotton, you mentioned, uh, this is the second time since the Civil War where cotton was over a dollar. So it's pretty, pretty profound. Um, but we see around the world the different commodities all being very strong. We've had these supply disruptions like in Russia. Uh, here and there we have... Uh, we have a record crop here for corn in the U.S., however, the demand side is so strong, and we think the USDA will probably lower their uh, yield expectations when we meet with them when they speak next uh, October 8th. So on the fringe, we're having some supply issues, but at the end of the day, with population growth uh, growing, obviously, very, very much so over the next 20, 30, 40 years, and increased consumption due to middle class rising, at the end of the day, 
it's really a demand story that's driving crop prices. So it's a big macro story. I mean, this is the kind of thing that economists are going to write many books about because it's a real shift in the way the demand in the world operates. Yes, and you can almost look at the recession that we had uh, the last two years as almost buying us time because demand tailed off for a little while there with the recession, and now it's coming back. So if we get back to trend line growth from 2012 on, call it 4% GDP growth, we can be in some real trouble going forward. So that's why we're pretty positive on the ag cycle long term. And the, to, the way to really to get the supply up, it's either going to come from land or it's going to come from productivity. We'll get a little bit of extra land over time, but ultimately I think productivity will be the real answer. And that's why I'm pretty bullish on the OEMs that make the tractors and combines, and Mori makes the wheels and tires that go into the, into the tractors and combines. That's going to be a big answer to how we, how we combat that longer, longer term. Andre Sizov, if you look at the Russian agriculture sector, are they spending a lot of money to try to increase productivity, to increase efficiency? In 2008, yes, farmers were heavily investing into inputs, into machinery, but this year, definitely no. Despite high prices, they have been damaged uh, by the drought, and they have a high price by very, but very low yields and don't have enough money to spend. And they also they are not confident right now. The sentiment is not positive on uh, spending on equipment. Larry, last question for you. If you look right now at prices, is it too late for investors who haven't gotten in to get in for the soft commodities? I have a personal bias towards, uh, towards corn at this point, which has been hovering around 5, 5.15, 5.20. And I think it, that there's a very good chance that if we don't have the yield that uh, people have been talking about, that we could see $6 corn uh, in the not too distant future. And so I'd be pretty bullish still here on corn. Sounds, that sounds like it's going to be an expensive picnic next year, eventually. <laughs> I want to thank you very much, uh, Larry DeMaria, coming to us from Stern AG Leach. Andre Sizov from Sovicon, uh, giving us some uh, expert information having to do with agricultural commodities. All right, more of our special look at emerging markets. This is Taking Stock on Bloomberg. I want to focus now on what's happening in South America. My next two guests are, have they, well, they have keen interest in farmland on the continent. Julio Pisa is the chief executive of Brazil Agro, the company that buys and develops rural properties for agricultural production and development. Also, Gabriel Blasi. He is involved in something similar in Argentina. He's the chief executive of Cresud, which buys and leases farms in the country's Pampas region. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Now, you're both here presenting what it is your companies do to potential investors as part of the Stern AG conference on agriculture. And Julio, are you finding that you're now extremely popular when you are somewhat, uh, you know, bringing an interesting investment idea, owning farmland? Definitely. I think it's, it's changed. In the past, farmers didn't quite get the attention we're getting quite right now. So I think it's an interesting moment for agriculture as a whole, and especially South America and Brazil. I think it's quite an interesting time for us to be here. Now, Gabriel, can you give us some insight into what's happening with the farmland sector uh, in Argentina? Well, as, as in every world in the world, a, a very strong attraction has appeared from the investor community over the farmland. The fact that the farmland behaves very well in inflation environments or even uh, has a very low correlation with the rest of the financial assets bring a lot of attention. Because of the recent history of inflation that, that we have, that's very a memory very present in, in, in Argentina. And on the other hand, Argentina is a very agricultural country. We have more than 200 years of history in agriculture. Our company, Cresud, but I, I, I'm, I'm really the CFO of the company, uh, is a company that has been listed for 50 years and more than, more than 10 years here in the States. And are you finding that foreign investors are more and more interested in participating in farmland in Argentina? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, this is reflecting in the, in, the, in the farmland prices all over the region, definitely. Julio, what about farmland prices in places like Brazil? Because you go out and you try to acquire more land for agricultural production. Is it getting more expensive? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we have acquired a significant amount of land so far, over 450,000 acres, and we're producing on a significant part of it. Prices are going up, 
uh, as expected, but yet uh, still fantastic opportunities for acquisitions there. Prices are not at the level you would find in the U.S., for instance. And is the actual production on these agricultural properties, is that for domestic consumption or is it also for export? We produce commodities. The four, some of, some of it will go to Brazil, some of it will get exported. It's, it's everywhere. And are you finding the same thing, Gabriel, well, that this is a, a demand that's coming from outside Argentina, from outside Latin America? In the case of Argentina, Argentina is really a net exporter of, of food. We have 40 million people. We produce food for 400 million people. Uh, at the end, it's, it's the most relevant production that the country uh, sent to the rest of the world. And what about the uh, future for farmland in a place like Brazil? Will there be more competitors trying to actually own the farmland? I think possibly yes. It's still a highly fragmented sector, therefore a fantastic opportunity for consolidation and growing and creating larger and larger portfolios of, of farms in Brazil. And one thing that I'd like to comment is that I don't think we're only exporting food. We're exporting ultimately water. Which is, and that is the reason why we believe South America and Brazil have such a great potential because of surplus of water that can be exported in the form of commodities. All right, so of, uh, exporting water, exporting food, and investing in agricultural land. I want to thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, Julio Pisa coming to us from Brazil Agro, and we have Gabriel Blasi talking about the, as the chief executive of Cresu. Thank you very much.